Okay, so again, welcome to our third session of the day uh, on leisure in the arts. I think uh, the presentations that we're going to hear today are something that a lot of us can relate to as we are eager to get back to having some leisure uh, and enjoying art, as we'll see in our second presentation, not just enjoying art, but producing art. Um, and in our third session, we'll be exploring something I think that's become increasingly relevant for those of us with access to it, social media and the impact that that has had on our world. Um, you know, it's been growing in impact, but I think even more so over the course of the pandemic. So we'll get kicked off today with a presentation by Donna Barbie, John Lamop, and Stephen Master, and their presentation entitled, When Sports Stood Still, COVID-19 and the Lost Season. We'll then have a presentation by Valerie Vicinich and Tony Attard on performing precarity in times of uncertainty, the implications of COVID-19 on artists in Malta. Uh, and I would add that presentation has recommendations that I think are globally uh, applicable, very good. Uh, and our third presentation will be by Noha Fikri on COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, social media explorations from the Arab world. So just a quick note on how we'll run it today. We'll have the presenters go in the order that I just mentioned. And once they presented, we will open up the chat for a discussion and question and answer session with the audience. I am going to mute the chat just while people are presenting so they're not distracted, but I'll open that up uh, as soon as the presenters are done. And then uh, the audience can either type their questions into the chat, feel free to send them to me directly uh, or raise your hands and feel free to ask them verbally. So with that in order, uh, Donna, John, Steve, if you guys are ready. Okay, good. Like many works published in the COVID-19 volumes, our chapter constitutes a snapshot of the summer of 2020, a very dynamic period. In that snapshot, we report on the worldwide stoppage of sports and meanings that stoppage implied. As we conducted our research and interviews, sports events were beginning to come back albeit as far different and most people would likely say diminished experiences for players and fans alike. Although much has changed in the sporting world in the past few months, we have still not returned to pre-COVID play, something that may never happen. The sporting world started tumbling on March 11th, 2020, when Utah jazz player Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID-19. Within 24 hours, the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, and Major League Soccer suspended their seasons, and March Madness was canceled. Fans quickly learned they would be without major sports leagues, high school sports, and everything in between. No Masters, no Wimbledon, no Kentucky Derby, even the Tokyo Olympics, Olympics were, were pushed to 2021. In the grand scheme of things, the suspension of sports hardly registers as tragic when compared to the lives lost, economic hardships, and social upheaval caused by COVID-19. Yet the absence of sports is notable in that they have historically served an important function during tragedy. Although sports could not distract nor unite us through the pandemic, their suspension presents an opportunity to examine their importance and to observe how deeply, if at all, we feel the loss, how we manage to cope and to fill the void, and how this unprecedented event might change sports or how we view them. Dutch historian Johan Huizinga explores why sports are worthy of analysis in his seminal work man the player. As Huizinga argues, play is distinct from ordinary life as it is enacted in temporary worlds within the ordinary world. French sociologist Roger Calois adds in man, play, and games that play is essentially a separate occupation carefully isolated from the rest of life. Sports fans understand and relish that separation. As Tyler Spence writes in the Bleacher Reports, for us fans, sports is our escape, our painkiller, 
When we are having a bad day or have our mind on stuff, it seems we forget about it after watching our team or reading up on mock drafts or rumors. Many sports fans, especially the most fanatical ones, show a super abundant, vital energy in this isolated, consecrated space. They don giant wedges of orange foam cheese. They paint their faces and chant, even remove, when removed from the immediacy of the competition by sports and uh, by television screens, fans experience exhilaration and despair and scream at the top of their lungs. Some people might say all of this is excessive. It is only a game after all. Fandom, however, is not about logic or reasoning, but emotion and often too much of it. Psychologist Daniel Wan developed the Sports Spectator Identification Scale, also called SSIS, to measure the intensity of a person's involvement with one or more sports. According to Juan Melnick Russell MPs, highly identified fans establish and maintain significant emotional responses for a variety of reasons, including the need for affiliation, desire for entertainment, and thirst for eustress. Often referred to as positive stress, eustress produces excitement and arousal that the average person may seldom experience in ordinary life. The SSIS additionally measures the significance that fans place on physiological and psychological stimulation while watching a competition. They found that male participants relish greater suspense because of the resulting higher levels of eustress. Another study concluded that fans achieve the most gratification when their team wins and they engage in burging or basking in the reflected glory of their team or player. Even before the pandemic, Rachel Ann Williams noted the significance of escape and emotion when watching sports. Quote, on its face, the world is a pretty grim place. At the same time, the world is falling apart. Sports fans everywhere take joy in their teams winning and wallow in their losing investing a tremendous amount of emotional energy into sports. What Williams had no idea was that the world falling apart would expand to a sudden sports stoppage in 2020. Thank you, Donna. I'm gonna take over now uh, and just give a summary of some of the, the uh, interesting qualitative, qualitative data that we uncovered uh, through interviews uh, and analysis um, uh, during last summer. Uh, so in 2020, sports fans worldwide, who would normally have achieved a sense of belonging by watching and following a particular sport, team, or athlete, often found themselves instead unified in their profound sense of loss. Uh, Katie, a college student athlete from South Florida, went home for spring break in March and never returned to her campus. Uh, her heartbreak of losing her playing season was only deepened by the loss of something so deeply woven into the fabric of her life. She said, normally sports are the only things on my living room uh, television, adding, I am beside myself that I won't be able to go to a Marlins game anytime soon. Similarly, Gregory, a 50-something financial services professional in Boca Raton, Florida, described the lack of any and all sports as an extreme loss, an actual void. Many fans during this time turned to online sports forums to air their pain among community members who are feeling the same loss. Users on sportsjournalist.com laid bare the impact that freezing of sports had on some of the more passionate fans. While many reported not missing sports as much as they thought they would, others shared a deep sense of loss. Uh, user BigPern23 wrote on April 4th, Quote, I have to say now more than ever, I wish I could watch a goddamn baseball game today. Although sports would begin to return, shadows of their former selves, by the middle of the summer, fans scrambled to replace the loss. Activities that six months earlier would have seemed unthinkable became the nourishment for a ravenous sports fandom. Uh, veteran sports columnist Thomas Boswell used in the Washington Post that, quote, 
Not much about the pandemic is instructive, but how we use our time in its wake, where we invest our passion, even if we just change the tilt of our heads a few degrees in the way we see the world, will be an education to us all. Juan, who we mentioned before, uh, predicted that many lowly identified sports fans may move away from sports during the pandemic, using their newfound time for other things. And he felt that believing uh, they would all come back when sports resumed was a faulty assumption. However, most experts agreed that moderate and highly identified fans have little interest in replacing that time with something other than sports. Andrew Billings, executive director of the sports communication program at the University of Alabama, claimed that fans see, quote, uh, sports fandom as the epitome of what society is missing during the pandemic, a common shared kinship and interaction, end quote. Sports fans therefore attempted primarily to replace the time they typically spent on live sports with other, I'll bet far less uh, satisfying uh, sports viewing. Early in the pandemic, probably the most common replacement was watching sports events that were being rebroadcast. Uh, Michael, an avid college basketball fan, watched all five of Duke's NCAA men's championship games, as well as the classic Duke-Kentucky 1992 Elite Eight game. ESPN also aired unusual sports programming, the kind of competition like axe throwing or cherry pit spitting that typically would run at non-peak hours. Uh, Michael says he tried watching some of those um, but it only entertained them for maybe five to 10 minutes. Another popular diversion during the months of April and May was the 10 part documentary about, about Michael Jordan titled The Last Dance, which garnered huge ratings and sparked conversations with mainstream media, not just sports outlets. Even a recent, uh, Evan, a recent college graduate reveled in the series claiming it, quote, satisfied me in a different way than live sports do, end quote. Despite the documentary's depth and quality, it is interesting to speculate whether it would have captivated so many um, if it had been released prior to the pandemic when there were still live sports. Although many turned to watching old classic games and oddball events during the pause, other sports fans turned their attention to an unlikely venue, the stock market. With sports shut down, avid sports gamblers needed an outlet to replicate the adrenaline rush of having financial stake in the outcome of a game, or in the case of fantasy sports, performances of individual athletes. Numerous news articles during this time discuss how day trading had replaced sports betting as America's pastime. The most high profile symbol of this shift from sports betting to day trading was David Portnoy, multimillionaire president of the Barstool Sports. With no more sports or sports gambling to cover, he started live streaming his stock trading during the last hour of the trading day, attracting a half a million viewers. In late May and early June, 2020, some events started to trickle back. If COVID-19 has no other long-term impact on sports, it exposed the vital role that fans play in creating the modern sporting event. NASCAR driver Kevin Harvick emerged victorious from his car immediately upon winning the first event back after the COVID-19 pause and said, quote, I didn't think it was going to be that much different. And then we win a race and it is dead silent out here. So we miss the fans. Broadcasters had to adapt quickly to limit the camera shots of empty stadiums. And the big debate for many sports leagues surrounded the use of artificial crowd noise. As sports started returning, Sports journalist Joe Gizondi remarked on how odd it would feel watching a game without fans. Quote, it's going to feel a little vacant, he said. I wonder how much I'm going to feel like things are abnormal instead of normal when I'm watching it. With one year behind us, we have started, uh, many have started to speculate what lasting effects uh, will the pandemic have and what will the future of sports look like? And I'll go ahead and pass that over to Steve. Thanks, John. For the average sports fan in the United States, springtime represents one of the more anticipated and cherished times of the year. College basketball reaches a crescendo with March Madness. The Masters Golf Tournament is contested amid the blooming dogwoods in Augusta, Georgia. And in big city ballparks throughout the country, the boys of summer begin their arduous 162 game season that endures 
until the weather cools in October. Bill McAtee, a veteran sports announcer, describes this stretch of time as part of the, quote, cadence or rhythm of the life of an American sports fan. And sure enough, over the past month, that rhythm, that rhythm seems to have returned. College basketball crowned Baylor University its champion three weeks ago. Just nine days ago, Hideki Mutsuyama became the first Japanese golfer to win the Masters. And tonight, weather permitting, Major League Baseball games will be played in 15 American cities. But while the games are being contested and champions crowned, we're still a long way from that so-called return to normal and even longer from understanding the impact of this unprecedented shutdown. This is true of so many aspects of life, from our health to education to the economy, and so it is with our complex but enduring relationship with sports. In the coming years, we'll begin to answer some of the questions raised in our chapter. What did the shutdown reveal about the role or meaning of sports in our culture, and what, if anything, may change in the wake of this unimaginable shock to the system. Predictably, snapshot analyses are already beginning to emerge, but these are based largely on data points that we would argue are easily misinterpreted or in irrelevant, especially at this embryonic stage of the sports world's return to normalcy. The most heavily an analyzed data point involves sports television ratings, which have seen a significant drop from pre-pandemic levels. In her February 28th, 2021 article in the Atlantic headline, headline, quote, America didn't need sports after all, author Jamel Hill argues that, quote, America's emotional connection to sports during a tumultuous time has been grossly overestimated. Hill cited a nosedive in TV ratings. And indeed, the numbers were dramatic. A 51% year-over-year drop for the NBA Finals, 61% for the NHL Finals, 45% for tennis's US Open, and 49% for the Kentucky Derby. Yes, even a Super Bowl featuring the league's greatest quarterback, Tom Brady, and his likely successor, Patrick Mahomes, drew its worst ratings in 15 years. In one sense, these ratings would seem to be counterintuitive. With so many sports fans essentially holed up at home and presumably suffering from withdrawal symptoms after such a long stretch without sports, the assumption was that they would enthusiastically embrace sports as return. Yet, based on our understanding of the important role of sports in our culture, the television ratings are neither surprising nor telling. That's because, as we heard earlier from the University of Alabama's Billings, what we cherish most about sports, the communal experience, that which connects us in real time and filters down through generations, has not yet returned. Last year's NHL and NBA playoffs were contested in bubbles with no fans. This season allows only limited seating. College basketball season, labeled by one major news organization as a, quote, mess, saw one out of every 10 games canceled due to health guidelines related to COVID. And the games were contested in mostly lifeless, empty arenas. The postseason tournament, aka March Madness, is typically contested in packed arenas throughout the country. This year's was played in three sparsely filled venues in one city, Indianapolis. And even before the tournament started, one team, Virginia Commonwealth, was forced out due to a positive COVID test. In October 2020, uh, in, in, a, in an October 2020 New York uh, Magazine article, sports journalist Will Leach cited several potential explanations for the low TV ratings since the return of sports. Among those, the quote, weirdness of it all. There's no question, he writes, that there's a certain amount of mental gymnastics that you must do to convince yourself that these games are real, that they are not just glorified scrimmages played to manufacture digital noise. Part of the entertainment package is fans. Maybe we're watching less because the product is lacking without them. 
Leach is the author, author of four well-received books on sports, including Are We Winning?, which is about the important role of baseball and his strong bond with his father. I can relate. Among my earliest memory of my father, memories of my own father is gripping his hand as we entered the arena for my first professional baseball game, seeing men that to an eight-year-old literally look like giants, a mesmerizing red, white, and blue basketball, and a frighteningly, frighteningly large number of fans packed shoulder to shoulder, roaring at every swish, dunk, or block executed by the home team. I loved it. There are legitimate questions to be asked about the future of sports' role in society. Younger generations seem less engaged, and many have been turned off by scandals, commercial oversaturation. But as sportsjournalist.com user Azrael noted in our chapter, sports will survive this reckoning because of their deep roots in our culture. Rather than revealing a drift away from sports, more likely the low television ratings reflect a longing for sports as we once enjoyed it, enjoyed it with jubilant unmasked crowds and high fives, kids chasing foul balls in the bleachers, the Lambo leap, gaudy hats at the Derby, Super Bowl parties, and the Cameron crazies bouncing in unison at Duke, North Carolina. Whether these traditions will bring us much joy or more of it remains an open question. But more and more, as the number of vaccination, vaccinated multiply, the return to sports and all its glorious traditions, as well as its imperfections, is on the horizon. The message for many fans is, is this, let me know when we get there. Yeah, I think I'm back off mute. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think you, I think your work hits on something that's felt individually experienced, enjoyed individually, but also in groups locally, and something that has a real global universality to it. Um, the individual sport no doubt changes from person to person or country to country or region to region, but the importance of sports for society, uh, I think, is something that, that, that's fairly universal. Uh, and with that idea of universal, that universality in mind, I want to turn to something else that's very universal and important for society, and that's the arts. And with that, we'll turn to Valerie and Tony to talk about the implications of the pandemic for, for artists in Malta. So Valerie, Tony, if you guys are ready. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, hi, can you see my shared screen, please? Yes, I believe so. So, good afternoon. Um, we're going to speak about our chapter entitled Performing Precarity in Times of Uncertainty, the Implications of COVID-19 on Artists in Malta. Specifically, it refers to Malta because fieldwork was carried out in Malta at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, however, as uh, Michael referred to, it has some global application to this and we're going to explore this further. I would like to start first by Bauman's, um, uh, in Bauman's documentary that quotes um, uh, this, the situation of uh, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uncertainty that we are living. And it's like today, more than ever, we are living permanently with a form of uncertainty that it's like that we don't really know where this will end, if it will ever end, and we're speaking about new normalities now. So um, we framed these ideas in terms of the uncertainty, particularly that artists are experiencing. The scope of, and significance of our work was to explore the everyday life of artists and their ex how especially their experienced financial loss um, throughout the pandemic. This is, uh, this understanding has been couched in a, an understanding more on precarious working conditions of artists, not only during the pandemic, but before the pandemic, where artists experienced precarious working conditions for various reasons. And therefore we are looking at an understanding of arts, artists and uh, um, in their everyday life in this 
way. We are drawing data from online survey um, that was carried out in March 2020. And the survey was used um, to inform the recommendations made to secure the rights for equitable income. In fact, the recommendations were forwarded to the Malta Enterprise. And here we are going to trace the way that the state's immediate response through this, through the implementation of government measures leading to the COVID wage supplements where artists were included in this. So let me start first by speaking about what we refer to performing precarity, particularly within this freebie culture, where here the term precarity, we are referring to how it is used in usually sociology and political economy, uh, economics to refer to insecure form of employment, usually through self-employed and short-term contracts. Um, Bourdieu speaks about this precariousness at work as the new mode of domination in contemporary capitalist society and how this has changed the landscape of work um, in new society. Obviously, this needs to be seen in relation also to the risk society that we are living in. The most um, interesting notions surrounding this term on precarity are related to um, the way workers have limited rights and social protection, their sense of powerlessness um, uh, to these uh, workplace rights, their insecurity at work, low wages, and sometimes as we're going to see even no wages, and individualized bargaining relations and the overall working environment. So indicators of precariousness applied to the everyday life of artists, we refer to three main themes. The first being the non-standard working conditions that usually artists are engaged in, the existence of the freebie culture, and the lack of representativeness of artists as a collective. So I'm going to elaborate briefly about these three. The first referring to non-standard working conditions where creative laborers are seen as an army of freelancers almost working intermittently um, and being engaged in casual temporary employment. Usually they move on from one project to the next. They live in this freebie culture, which refers to these un underpaid or non-paid workers, um, uh, with usually there is this normalization of internships, um, um, uh, which is a new kind of what Perlin calls it, a new form of network capitalist society, where artists involve themselves in internship with the idea to obtain skills uh, as well as to obtain exposures and experiences. Lack of represent uh, representations in locally, there is hardly any representational groups for artists, particularly during the time of the, 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 uh, the survey, because now we're going to speak, Tony will going to emphasize more on the changes that happened. Um, uh, in this particular area shortly. So Tony, maybe would like to go ahead. Sure, thank, thanks, Valerie. Um, so uh, this study we're, we're talking about also, um, there was a, another study which, which I had also conducted specifically on artists' payments. Um, and it was, it was very clear that there were already the uh, pre-pandemic uh, context, in the pre-pandemic context, uh, difficulties with artist payments, late payments, and also, um, and some were significant in terms of waiting payment between 500 and 2,000 euro, for example, which uh, refer to at times, you know, a two months average uh, income of, of an artist. So, so we, we started seeing these patterns of precarious employment emerging even within the, the pre-pandemic uh, context. And of course, then uh, very much emphasized and became the norm in, in during the pandemic itself. Uh, the methodology for the uh, research itself 
um, value, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this was an opt-in online survey that was designed uh, to measure specifically the impact of uh, the virus and how the livelihoods uh, of artists were, were impacted. Um, uh, the idea here was also to uh, study this over a period of time. In fact, until today, actually, there were three surveys which, which emerged as part of the study. Um, and also, uh, this was important because at that time, there was no artist-led association in Malta that could lobby and support. So it also served as a basis for to create a voice for the artists. And in fact, the opt-in survey was, was uh, shared on social media platforms, even covered in, in the media. And actually we, we note uh, a significant high um, participation. So 346 responses. Uh, and what I would like to emphasize here is that usually when we talk about artists, by default, we tend to think of professionals. So those earning an income, but on a small island like Malta, there tends to be quite a bit of an ambiguous status of an artist, those who have other jobs, but do it on the side, the kind of you know, the amateurs, but still referring to themselves as artists. So this survey really wanted to create this distinction and very important distinction as we shall, we shall see between those who earn an income exclusively from the arts and others who earn income from the arts as part of their livelihood. So other, other sources of, of income impacted um, over there. What we see specifically here is what, you know, this is, so the survey was released uh, in March when the new measures, the first measures were actually uh, announced by government. So therefore theaters were shut down, events were canceled or postponed and the first direct hit was immediate. So at the time, the majority of events uh, were, shift, were, were canceled uh, and usually in terms of from an economic point of view, uh, a cancellation means loss of income, postponement usually refers to deferral of income. So that income may may be um, honored at some point or another. As you will see, um, the differences we have in the particular subsectors, uh, the work, the, the, the largest amount of, of events impacted were those uh, in, in terms of public performances and exhibitions and concerts, followed by, of course, then the, 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 the legacy, so to speak, of these measures on upcoming work. So by then, uh, rehearsals were cancelled and the creative research itself was being cancelled. So we start seeing then a kind of a collapse of, of, of a whole system in terms of the production cycle uh, that would lead to um, uh, the livelihood, that would impact the livelihood of, of any artist. In this initial moment, we start seeing that the shifting online was um, visible, but not as strong as was witnessed in the in these and in the other surveys because by then you know people had started artists started to figuring out how to navigate uh, the the online world and we see there that arts education itself was the most um, uh, the activity that could most be, um, be shifted to to online online activity when it comes to income and this is where we start seeing the differences in terms of uh, shifts in terms of financial losses. We can go to the next slide, please. We start seeing here the differences between the two groups of those earning partial income and those exclusive income. And we see a clear division of those earning partial income. So losses registered at that particular point where primarily mainly between 100 and 500 euro and the distinct difference between those exclusively uh, earning an income from the arts on the higher end of, of the spectrum. Um, in terms of impact, we see that the majority of those uh, receiving uh, an income exclusively from the arts where most of their income for this period had been lost. And, and we see this sustained until today when, with the latest uh, research that actually still confirms this pattern. So even the idea that there was no hint at recovery throughout these uh, 12, 12 months, uh, with very few actually declaring no impact uh, on, on uh, income. Valerie? 
Yes. Um, so continuing on that, um, we trace there for the COVID wage supplement, which is the government measures in Malta um, uh, in order to help um, workers who experienced financial loss. And uh, working people in the, the section identified in NXA, whether full-time employed or self-employed or freelance, were entitled to a monthly supplement of 800 euros, whereas part-time employees were entitled to 500 euros. So these measures were reviewed in January 2021 and March 2021. The recommendations we made in our article refers to the way the public, the, the public sector as a major investor in the arts needs to set example by ensuring that fair and equitable conditions are offered to artists, especially when providing um, contracts and payments on time. We also referred to public funding commitments be they commissions or grants, should emphasize further the importance of appropriate remuneration for artists, as well as the right to enjoy a living income for the artistic work they generate. We also refer to the continuous advocacy with the private sector, which is also needed to ensure that the business community understands and values the contribution artists can make to the development of their enterprise. Self-employed and freelance artists included in wage supplement scheme, um, uh, which was a very step, uh, a very important noteworthy step forward for uh, having creative practitioners involved in the, this scheme. One major barrier for the creative sector to improve its professional status has been the lack of collective sector-led voice of artists through unions and associations. The in, in, in thus industry-led associations therefore opened up conversations with government to discuss financial measures, yet it became evident that there is an absence of an equivalent industry-led organization in Malta for the arts. However, this gap was filled by the newly set up Malta Entertainment Industry and Arts Association, which now addresses this void. As conclusion remarks, we would like to add that the data presented initiated discussion on a national platform and prompted actions through the COVID wage supplement in Malta, which was a systematic allocation of governmental measures to artists and creative practitioners. We emphasize the need for artists to secure contact contracts that protect their rights over a period of time and to be represented adequately by unions and lobby groups and or sector-led associations. And we refer to measures and policies which are necessary for an equitable income to artists, particularly to support them during time when their livelihood is at stake, particularly during the pandemic times. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Valerie and Tony. You know, I, I mentioned before, even though your, your case study is Malta, I think it's very easy to draw broader implications in, in lots of other situations, especially with your, your recommendations. Um, in the same way, I, I think we can appreciate the local and regional peculiarities, the idiosyncrasies maybe is a better word, but with broader global understandings. Uh, in our next presentation, I know a Fikri who will talk about uh, memes in the Arab world. So, Noha, if you're you're ready. Yes, thank you so oh, much. And, and Valerie, and maybe you need to. Oh, sorry, yeah. Valerie, maybe you need to stop sharing. So. Oh yes, of course. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Sorry, uh, Noha. Whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for taking time in such a busy time of the semester or year. And I'm so glad to be here amongst you. And I'm also presenting on behalf of a number of co-authors of this chapter. So this chapter is titled COVID, the pandemic, social media explorations from the Arab world. And it's a chapter that is co-authored by myself and my students who I taught a year ago at the American University in Cairo in an undergraduate anthropology and sociology course titled Arab Society. 
And yes, I'll give you just a brief history of where the chapter came from, and then I'll get to the argument and then the explorations of the memes from the Arab world. So basically, this was part of a course titled Arab Society. And this has always been a challenge, namely how to teach Arab society to mostly Arab students. And how really to deal and engage with the object Arab, how to define the category Arab without reifying or othering the people enclosed in this category. And the way for me to do it has really been always to engage with existing literature, along with relying on an autoethnographic component. And by that, I mean the students were always basically engaging with their family and with their friends and writing about these experiences on weekly responses or even in the like more, more major assignments, the essays, for example, every month. So with COVID, this has all been rendered a challenge because how do we engage with people online? And what do we do at this very uncertain moment, namely March 2020? So just to cut the story and get to the argument and then go back to the story, the main argument is basically that we believe that Facebook offers a rich ethnographic ground for anthropological and sociological reflection, especially at a time when ethnographic in-person fieldwork is rendered impossible or inaccessible. And in the case of Egypt, in the particular case of Egypt, Facebook plays a crucial role as a moral police in which basically the shared news updates and memes and comics maintain or strengthen the boundaries between an Arab society and an other society. And this other can be foreign, can be European, can be an Asian other. So basically, to go back to the story, on March 12th, 2020, 2020, the American University in Cairo decided to shift the education and teaching online. And this was basically taking place through relying on Zoom and Blackboard Learn. And in my class were 30 students. And given a very unstable internet quality in Egypt, this was very difficult to carry out a class with 30 people with their cameras on twice per week was very almost impossible to do it synchronously at least. So I began exploring other options. And what happened is that I noticed that myself and all the students were basically spending most of the time on social media, on Facebook and other social media outlets. And I then decided to put the social scientist and the social media user in conversation through the class. So I decided that we carry, we carry the class on Facebook. We created a Facebook, a closed Facebook group for the class only, and in which I would basically post every week a mini lecture and then a few ethnographic posts that the students would be sharing, commenting on, engaging with, as to replace the kind of in-class engagement. It was never a perfect replacement, but I think it worked eventually. So for the final essay or the final paper, what happened is that we began th thinking about Facebook and theorizing Facebook as an ethnographic field site in which we were basically observing and analyzing and noting or taking note of what our families and friends and social circles are sharing on Facebook. And the questions was, what do people share on Facebook? How do they share them and where? And what do these patterns of the shared memes and news updates tell us about an ever-changing Arab world? And again, this was a final assignment. And what we tried to do is also not to take social media as a world, a separate world on its own. So we really did our best to basically include posts and updates and memes from people that we have offline knowledge of so that we can do the analysis or the exploration of the online memes in light of the offline knowledge of the people. And just to give you a bit, his, a bit of historical background of Facebook in Egypt, it first began as a very exclusive virtual space for Arab youth, usually associated with explicit content, with courting, etc. And then it began unfolding into more of a normative venue, densely populated by Arab parents and even grandparents getting together to connect with distant family members. And this is very much reflected in numbers. So we have an Arab social media report reflecting that in the seven year period between 2010 and 2017, we had 14 million new users in Egypt joining Facebook, adding up to 30 million existing users out of a total of 96 million population in Egypt at the time. And we really expect these, to, these numbers to have risen significantly since that uh, report. And so this hyper presence of parents and grandparents in, in, on Facebook rendered Facebook what we call an Arab home salon. And this is basically a room, a room in most of like the Arab households and apartments that is kept for visitors and where the most boring and irrelevant and forcible small talk takes place. 
So again, Facebook really, the value of Facebook at this time during the pandemic became more of a moral police, governing what families are saying, what friends are sharing, and scrutinizing each other's posts and presence. And one significant genre that we are basically focusing on is memes. And memes were again used to reinforce the social norms and the pandemic rituals with classist and racist overtones. And in his introductory chapter to the volume, Ryan theorizes COVID as a syndemic. And basically, syndemic is trying to describe the intertwining health and social dimensions of the moment. Taking this one step further, we explore COVID as a pandemic. And by that, we mean it's an enunciation, again, of health and society through the very particular nexus of social media and memes. So what are memes exactly? Memes originally were developed in biology, and then they got more and more developed by social scientists and media scholars who were using memes basically to describe, and I quote, the propagation of items such as jokes, rumors, videos, and websites from a person to a person via the internet. And they differ from virals in that virals are about a single cultural unit, such as a video or a photo, being shared repeatedly. But a, a meme is basically a collection of text whose users replicate and remix with every share. So for example, I can share a photo, but then I'm going to play with the caption. I can share a video, but I can play with the background music, for example. So with every share, there is actually something happening. There is a change taking place, or again, kind of a, a remixing taking place. So our primary explorations were basically on the first level that we had a reversed internalized Orientalism. So given a history of colonialism in, in the Arab world, but also Egypt, a foreigner's complex was always present. And by that, I mean denouncing everything Arab in favor for everything Western. So it's always a favoring of Western habits, thought, and media over the Arab counterpart. And this was surprisingly, even if momentarily reversed during COVID, in the way through which, through which memes were basically critiquing Western habits and mocking the rising pandemic cases, and even taking pride in Egypt offering aid to European countries, again, almost a year ago now, earlier in the pandemic. So for us, what this was doing is basically opening up a space of dialogue on power structures, on global dynamics and offering us a moment to look back and to observe global powers and position ourselves as an Arab world and an e as Egypt vis-a-vis -vis a broader world. And the other thing that we also explored is basically the internal inequalities evident in these memes. And we had a lot of classist memes in which people were basically making fun of those who are still going to work or posting jokes on people hanging their masks and wishing them for use forgetting or making fun of the drastic inequalities of the pandemic, in which not everyone was basically having or can afford buying disposable face masks or even working from home. And one also one other thing that we explored is basically we adapted the Dr. Kobler-Ross five-stage model of grief to the reactions, to the early reactions of the pandemic. So we would basically document the memes through the stages of uh, denial or anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and see how people reacted differently with the unfolding of time. So as a conclusion, just to keep it short and allow time for discussion and questions, we were basically arguing that perhaps the pandemic has not drastically changed global power dynamics. But it really offered a space to, problem to problematize these, especially in the beginning. On Facebook, Arab users began letting go of Western modernity dreams and shifting the gaze back to themselves. And if anything, this assignment, this essay, which then became translated into this chapter, has basically been an Arab society course on steroids. And by that, I mean it was such a magnifying lens through the banal angle of memes. It magnified all the communal, but also toxic, the loving, but also cruel aspects of an ever-changing Arab world. And the last thing is that we really believe that now more than ever is lies a potential for digital ethnography. So I think with the inaccessibility of in-person fieldwork, we all are going to eventually, inevitably, going to shift our lenses online, whether to social media or anything else. And that we also consider memes as very, very precious ethnographic artifacts, but also as modes of knowledge production, in which people are always engaging in creative and open-ended dialogues and conversations on, again, a very small or tiny cultural artifact that can be a video or a photo. 
So yes, I thank you again for listening and looking forward to the comments. Thank you, no, okay. Well, I'm never quite sure if I turn my, my mute off. Thank you, Noah, for that uh, excellent and insightful presentation uh, uh, as always from you. Um, I, in, in listening, I've turned the chat on, by the way, for those in the audience, if you want to go ahead and start typing your, your questions in or raise your hand. One thing that I think ties the three presentations together today uh, is the way they speak to something that we all have come to miss, that some of us were missing even before the pandemic, and that's creativity and socialization and humanity. Uh, in many ways, they speak to the impact the pandemic has had on our, on our souls. Uh, whether you're a religious person and you think of that individually or not, we can still think of cultures and communities as having souls. And I think the presentations today have really spoken to the impact the pandemic uh, has had on that. So with that comment, um, I'd, I'd like to open it up if there's any questions um, from, from the audience or from presenters to each other. Maybe actually while, while people are thinking about that and typing those in, I want to kick it off uh, with a question for, for all three of the groups. And if you think some, there were talks about recommendations, there were some talks about lessons learned. Um, do you think anything will change afterwards? And if so, what? Is there likely to be some long lasting impact? Are we likely to take these lessons? Will they be more short term ephemeral sorts of things? Or do you think there's a possibility for deeper structural changes? I can certainly speak a little bit about that as far as sports go. Um, it, it, I think it's impossible to tell at the moment what kinds of changes there's going to be. Certainly, I think there's going to be changes as far as, um, you know, we, we may continue to check temperatures when people go into stadiums and there may be uh, changes to seating. But, but one thing about the sports world is that it is steeped in nostalgia. Um, and I, I think your, your average sports fan is really going to want sports to remain the way they were before the COVID pandemic, um, you know, because of the, you know, and, and Steve's comments, you know, thinking back about his, his, uh, his experience uh, as a child going to a game. I mean, sports fans have that where there's this element of, um, looking back to the past and, and remembering the way things were and how sports can kind of bring back those memories. And I think there's going to be a real loss if there's a significant shift uh, in the way sports are handled moving forward. If, if I may add something too, in terms of how, what the future looks like for the arts, um, Unfortunately, right now, I think we're still living through a bit of a doom and gloom situation, uh, whereas, you know, the majority want to get out of, but I think the fatigue and it has kind of kicked in. Um, probably we're going to see many more conversations in terms of even this, this idea of even like universal basic income, more conversations on that in terms of more secure contracts, longer contracts for artists and engagement. Um, and it's this kind of situation has also opened up a new conversation in terms of online engagement and how we, you know, the possibility of engaging new audiences and developing or transforming current audiences into online audiences. The desire and the appetite for the live uh, is still there. It's still a strong, um, I, I don't think it will at any point replace the live component, but there are gaps of opportunities um, but what is of concern now is the immediate, is whether artists can actually pay the bills today. Um, and even in the, the latest research, we're already starting to see um, very strong evidence of, of brain drain, of actually people leaving the sector. So once you start leaving the sector, the return to that activity is going to take longer. Um, so, and, and we're seeing this across the globe you now after so many people have, have you know, been furloughed and, and, and artists, you know, sourcing other, other areas of, of, of activity. No, 
Saha, did, did you want to add anything? Yes, I, I was actually thinking of basically the ethics, the ethics of conducting research on social media and how this is going to be, I think we're witnessing also a shift in the ethics protocols and the review boards. For example, if students would like to, incl to include the social media part component in their fieldwork, how would this be ethically done, whether on private or public groups, and how would people navigate those things and even review boards, I think is something that is going to inevitably change in the coming period. All, all good responses, lots of food for thought. I think um, uh, a lot of the research that came together in these two volumes, I'm hoping people will continue to pursue, uh, because it's no doubt a lot of it's different now than it even was when it was completed. Uh, and a lot of it's gonna be different by tomorrow, for sure, and six months from now and, and a year from now. So I'm really looking forward to see how, how all of your avenues of research kind of continue and, and develop. I wanna to get to another question in the chat here. Uh, Alejandro says, thank you to the presenters, very different but complementary perspectives to understand uh, to the importance of, of those intangibles for society. I would like to ask whether the fact that most forms of leisure and culture were immediately tagged as non-essential and canceled and a revolution did not take place as a result will result in politicians or society considering these forms of human interaction as less central or relevant than they used to be, which may translate in cutting subsidies to the arts, visibility, et cetera, or on the contrary, they will come back with even more force. Uh, what are your thoughts? I would kind of like to address that whole concept of non-essential. Um, and certainly we hear that all the time when we're dealing with sports. Oh, that's just sports. Oh, that if, if, if it goes away, no one is actually going to be harmed, except, you know, the, the athletes themselves will not have an opportunity to, to make money, but they're so rich anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we haven't found that to be true at all. We have found that people have a real felt loss. Um, my mother is 93 years old and it has been in lockdown in Bismarck, North Dakota in a care center for over a year now. The only days that she feels joy is when she can watch golf. And she, when, when the COVID was at its worst, she was fine re-watching the golf. <laughs> it was essential to her life. She would watch years ago golf and still be fine with it. It's what gave her joy. And I mean, that's what Nzinga is, is talking about is what is play and how essential is play to our lives? And, and his answer and others answer is that children play for a really big and important reason is because it gives them something in their lives to build on and so on. And it doesn't leave our lives when we're adults. We play and we play vicariously as fans or we play um, really as, as players. So I, I think Alejandro's question is really key and very important. Can I, can I add a point on the non-essential element in, in the arts? And this is you know, the perennial debate now and then also flagging up the arts as once again, you know, and it, I think the biggest tragedy we've experienced this year is actually splitting work as essential and non-essential in principle. You know, we've divided society in two and anyone linked to one is essential, the other is non-essential. But I've had some of my best friends are paramedics and they said, you know, to me, the most essential thing was going home and being able to read a book, to listen to some music, because that is what actually saved me. So, in fact, they were the best advocates for the arts because they said, you know, I can't really believe why this is even happening for the arts. Probably the repercussion of all this is not going to happen in the immediate, but as Governments need to start repaying their loans of massive loans taken in, the, in, in this, you know, cuts are probably going to be made. And this is where, once again, we're going to reopen the debate in terms of what's essential, what's non-essential, and economic arguments are, are going to. So probably if, and, and, and this is where also the whole world, this is a, probably one of the very few moments in recent history where the whole world has experienced a common element. Um, and we start seeing differences in how governments treated the arts. So the first to respond probably are the ones with the strongest cultural policies, the ones with a quite uh, a rich history in terms of investing in the arts, those who did not respond. And probably that situation is going to be 
enhanced even further in the coming months and years until you know the recovery is going to so so unfortunately this is what the pattern is going to keep on replicating itself um but i'm an eternal optimist so i'm sure that at this point you know if society has not identified the importance of physical activity in sports whilst people were locked up at home and the inspiration from arts then if this wasn't the time to prove this then i don't know when this the time is going to come in the united states the arts were um under siege long before the pandemic ever hit because it is an ideological philosophical positioning and we have had extreme political stances so if anything i think it has drawn more attention the pandemic that is has drawn more attention to the importance of the arts and i'm looking forward to an increase rather than a decrease yeah. in support for the arts I, I certainly hope that all of your optimism is correct um i'm a sociologist so i don't tend to be optimistic but there's a little human side of me when i'm not being a professional that wants to wants to share that optimism so uh, I certainly hope so. Um, we're, we're, we're a little bit over time now, so we're gonna have to wrap it up for this session, but I wanna say thank you again to our presenters uh, for coming and, and sharing your knowledge and, and insights with us um, and to the audience for coming and, and learning from the knowledge and insights. Um, our next session will be our keynote for the day. It's Professor Eichlin Cohen, uh, who's the deputy director of Harvard Law School and also the director of their Petrie Flom Center for biotechnology, bioethics, and now he's going to be angry because I can't remember the other bio, um, but he will be joining us for his keynote address talking about the intersection of COVID-19 and the law and addressing specifically issues of surveillance and inequality. So it should be a, a great presentation, I hope. I hope you'll all stick around for that. And we'll take a short break now and be back in about 10 minutes with that. So thank you all again. Thank you.